Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Now, you know, during these History Hangouts, we like to bring you some of the great research being done by folks who have used the historical collections at the Hagley Library, especially scholars who have received support from the Hagley Center. One such scholar joining me today, and I'm very excited, is Professor Regina Blaschek. And she is a longtime friend of Hagley, graduate of the Hagley program, and uh, we'll be discussing her book project, The Synthetics Revolution, and more particularly, a chapter from that project called The Mad Russian. Now, Professor Blaschek is a professor of business history at the University of Leeds in the UK. And Reggie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're welcome. Well, let's start by painting with broad strokes. What are you researching and writing about? Well, I'm writing a book called The Synthetics Revolution, which deals broadly with the um, impact of uh, man-made and synthetic fibers on uh, fashion and textiles from about 1880 uh, to uh, year 2000. So more specifically, the book looks at the period 1920 to uh, 1980. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book that um, is a bookend to my uh, 2012 book, The Color Revolution, which examined uh, the role of uh, color management in American consumer culture uh, during the uh, broad part of the first part of the 20th century. And um, I know we want to drill down to a particular part of this project. Uh, would you per perhaps introduce us to the Mad Russian? Yes, so one of the book chapters um, in the first half of the book um, deals with uh, the history of rayon at DuPont. So the, when people study the um, synthetics, uh, history of synthetics and uh, textiles, they normally focus on the, um, the, the true synthetic era, the, the post-nylon era from 1939 to now. And a number of books have uh, focused on this topic. My book, however, um, looks very deeply at the right in part at the rayon era and one of the which ran from about 1920 to 1960 uh, overlapping with the synthetic era and um, so one of the uh, chapters in the book is called Mad Russian and it deals with an important um, uh, historical actor at the DuPont company uh, during the rayon age his name was Alexis Somaripa or Alex for short and he uh, is known as the Mad Russian because he uh, he uh, was a, he, during World War uh, II he left Dupont uh, to join uh, to serve uh, the American military as a civilian non-combatant uh, participant in the war, and he was killed on the Western Front uh, with some uh, by well, he got basically squashed by a tank. But uh, he was a very heroic uh, civilian on the Western Front and was given this nickname, the Mad Russian. So I call him the Mad Russian because he was Russian born. And, and what was his connection with DuPont and perhaps particularly with um, this phenomenon that you're emphasizing, which is the connection between synthetic materials and consumer culture? So um, I do want to tell you a little bit about his background, but I'll answer your question first. Um, so he came, so Maripa came, Alex, came to DuPont in 1925. He was 25 years old. He was a bright young thing. And he was fresh from um, the Harvard Business School and from a stint in uh, working in a textile mill in uh, uh, Alabama. And he worked at DuPont from uh, 1925 until, his, uh, until he left for the war effort in the early 1940s. And he was involved in a number of things. He was one of the first people at DuPont to do quantitative market research on the textile industry. That was his first job. But his real contribution was to develop a program called the Fabric Development Service. The Fabric Development Service was based in New York City in the eventually once at to Park Avenue and the DuPont offices at Two Park Avenue and eventually in the DuPont offices at the Empire State Building. And from there, he and his team interfaced with the textile um, mills that all had offices uh, at the base of the Empire State Building because this was the New York textile district. Mm -hmm. And it was the place where all of the textile mills of any significance had New York offices so that they could serve the national market, but also be close to the makers up, 
the cutters on 7th Avenue. So he, so Maripa and his team served as the interface between the DuPont, the chemists and the uh, managers at the Buffalo plant, the Waynesboro plant, at the uh, other uh, rayon plants, and the, the New York market, the important New York market where all of the women's, most of women's clothes were made and some men's clothes. And that places him in a fascinating position uh, to view these networks through his eyes, doesn't it? It does. And um, he was uh, very opinionated. He, he liked to write um, uh, detailed reports. In fact, one, um, uh, one great treasure trove that I found in the Hagley archives when I was digging through them last summer um, was uh, some of his reports as manager of the Fabric Development Service. Mm -hmm. And these detailed reports date from, uh, he started managing the Fabric Development Service in 1930, but his reports, first reports date from about 1935, and they run up through, up through the war when a, one of his uh, assistants took over while he was uh, away and into the late uh, war period. So uh, these are very, very detailed reports. In fact, they're so detailed that one manager kind of made a snide remark about them one time and said, oh, this stuff is just so detailed. We are so, not enough of an executive summary for me. <laughs> but fantastic for historians. Absolutely. And, yeah. Well, let, well, let's go ahead and circle back. What was Alex's background? Where did he come from? What qualified him to do this kind of work? Well, it's a very timely story because he was Russian, born in Odessa, Ukraine, Udessa, and then Odessa, Russia. And uh, his family was from St. Petersburg, and his father was a judge. And so he was a member of uh, uh, not the aristocratic uh, end of society, but uh, upper upper echelons of Russian society. And uh, in the summer, the family uh, vacationed in Odessa to enjoy the seaside port, which we've all seen pictures of how beautiful the city is. And so he went they, He went to Odessa, and his parents went to Odessa, he was born there. He uh, eventually, uh, as the son of a judge, he went to the Imperial, as a boy, he went to a military academy, and then went to the um, Imperial Law School in St. Petersburg, which was a, a, like a high school for training young boys of the elite to work in the Russian administrative state. So they would have become judges or they would have become bureaucrats, etc. But uh, so Maripa's career as a future member of the Russian elite was cut short by the Russian Revolution, which broke out shortly during the time when he was in his final years of study at the, um, at the St. Petersburg uh, Law School. And he was forced, he and, uh, he and some members of his family were forced to flee Russia. Uh, his father was, um, his father was, uh, he had a brother, his father was imprisoned for a while. His, his uh, brother was uh, fought on the uh, Eastern, on the Western front and was, uh, was also taken captive. And he was fortunate to, uh, to have left Russia at age uh, 17 or 18 and he fled to Europe. From, now, he's a very talented guy, which makes him so interesting, is that he was uh, one of these people who was very good at languages. And uh, this was probably characteristic of the Russian elite at the time. He learned French as a boy. He could speak German. He could speak Greek. Uh, and eventually, he learned to speak English. So after he uh, left Russia, and uh, the details are not clear about you know how he left Russia and who he was wandering around with and what members of his family were with him. None of that is clear. But he spent some time in Greece working as a translator for the Greek army, and then eventually found his way to England, where he must have picked up English. And while he was in England, he uh, I don't know what he did. I would imagine that his translating skills were quite helpful there. And he eventually sailed from England to the United States. And his goal was to come to America to be a rich American. So he landed in Boston in 1920 as 20 year old uh, Russian immigrant. From there, he had heard about the Harvard Business School, and he um, may have had a sponsor who uh, helped him during his time in Boston, and he entered the Harvard Business School, then called the Harvard School of Business Administration, and took a two-year course there. His uh, professor, one of his professors was Melvin Copeland, one of the pioneers of marketing research, among others. So that's his early background. And uh, wh where did he go from there? What was the path from there to DuPont? 
Well, he went to, he had a two-year course um, of study at Harvard where he studied, uh, was able to uh, communicate with the uh, archivists at the HBS and they looked up his record for me because it's private, but they were able to um, give me a list of his courses. And so he studied with Copeland and he studied with other marketing pioneers, but he's interested in international business and finance. And he graduated in 1922. From there, he was like a typical 20-something. I was a little surprised because it's 1922, and I thought people were maybe a little more um, uh, directed and focused back then. But he was like a typical 20-something. He kind of drifted around for a while. And as part of his drifting, he um, went up to Lowell, Massachusetts, where he um, he went into the Lowell Textile Institute. Textile School or Textile Institute. And this was one of the many, many, many dozens of schools that trained men and some women for skilled jobs in manufacturing. And Lowell was the center of one of the centers of the um, American textile industry, and he enrolled in a course there to study textiles. So he um, had good training. So he went to Harvard, you know, he spoke all these languages. He was very, very elegant and very European. And he was very charming. He was very handsome. You know, I have pictures of him. He was dashing. He was very handsome, very slim. And so he had this Harvard degree. <clears throat> and then he went <clears throat> studied textiles. And so he knew something about textiles. He didn't finish the, the course. He went to night school. And he only went for a year. But he got after a year, he got a job and went to a textile mill in Alabama. So by this point, the uh, New England textile mills were starting their migration to the south. And the Nashua Manufacturing Company of Nashua, New Hampshire, which was a big cotton textile town, uh, started opening plants in Alabama. And he went and worked uh, for one of their mills there for um, uh, in nine months or so. I think he, he was a, a junior job. I mean, he made no in his um, memories. He doesn't make any, uh, he, you know, he says, this is an entry level job. I have no idea what I'm going to learn and what I'm going to go from here. but. I want to uh, start on my course for being a rich American, so I'll go. <laughs> um, and so after nine months in Alabama, he um, comes back to Boston. He's uh, fallen in love with a uh, widow, a young widow with a number of children during his time there in New England. He comes back and he works with Melvin Copeland on a study of cotton prices. Oh, so you got to start to see how his uh, persona and his expertise emerges and how it would be a perfect fit for DuPont. So he works with Copeland and on a study of cotton prices. And one of the deans in late 1925, which is where we are now, um, uh, hears about a job at DuPont, the DuPont Rayon Company in Buffalo. They had a plant in Buffalo where they made rayon. Buffalo was a big manufa important manufacturing city right on the Niagara River, and there was a big grain processing at the mouth of the Erie Canal. It was in a very, very important city. And DuPont opened its rayon plant there in 1920. And so in 1925, they were looking for a statistician to help them do market surveys. And uh, they went to Harvard and um, uh, said, who do you want? And they Somaripa ended up being recommended for the position as a statistician in Buffalo. And he got the job, and he started in December 1925. Oh, what what a path! Now I wonder what was it about textiles that attracted Samaripa? Um, was it his interest in fashion, his predilection for for that, or or what what else maybe? Yeah, it's not really clear um, why he picked textiles, but it is clear that he was a man of good taste. That he was, um, you know, uh, came from this. Uh, aristocratic background, this elite background. His family probably had a beautiful home. They went to, you know, the resorts every summer. Uh, some summers when he was a boy, they would go to Paris. His mother would take them to Paris, mm -hmm. where, where he learned French one summer. And um, so he was at, kind of schooled in this kind of uh, um, Euro European um, high culture. And his cousin, was a famous ballerina. His, his cousin also left, his female cousin left Russia uh, around this same time and she uh, ended up dancing for the Ballet Russe in Paris and then eventually had a career in New York as a dancer. So he was part, so, so he was always beautifully dressed. You see pictures of him, um, what few pictures you see of him survived. His hair was was beautifully combed and thick head of hair and a beautiful high collar and 
perfectly cut suit and very slim, five foot eight and 145 pounds. Think Fred Astaire. And, uh, you know, and so he was, uh, when he moved to New York, uh, we know that he lived on the Upper East Side opposite in a new building. Um, eventually he moved to New York. And in about 1930, he was living uh, up in a new building opposite Central Park, which was the height of style. And so he was, he loved the opera. It's known that he loved the opera. He loved theater. He loved high culture. So the material, the fact that he was interested in material life is, is kind of part and parcel of that European tradition, which values kind of things and beauty and style. So I think that's what must have led him to textiles. Well, and possessing this interest and background in high culture, how did that situate him in the uh, leadership of DuPont? So that's a very good question. So um, Somaripo was uh, never really a top manager at DuPont. He was really a middle manager. And was, I love studying these people who are not the top managers and who are not the famous scientists like Wallace Carruthers, but who are the foot soldiers that get the DuPont company to actually work and then to contribute to um, its uh, many innovations that often go on study. And so he was really a middle manager. So um, he was well respected at DuPont because you see tidbits of him early on being asked to translate this or that document from Germany by the mm -hmm. top managers. So the top managers uh, knew he was. DuPont Rayon Company at this time was managed by a guy, it was a separate, DuPont at this time in the 1920, 1925 had a subsidiary called the DuPont Rayon Company that had plant in Buffalo and a uh, sales office in New York. And so it was, it was not uh, entirely integrated into the main company, it was a subsidiary. And the man who managed the subsidiary is another fascinating character that I start my book with, is, who nobody knows about. His name was Len Yerkes, Leonard Yerkes. He was a Philly guy. <laughs> he went to the University of Pennsylvania and uh, was trained as an engineer. And from there actually went to uh, Joseph Bancroft and Company in Wilmington and uh, worked on a rayon plant for them during the war, which nobody knows anything about. <laughs> and that's why he ended up managing DuPont Rayon. He was a, he was what he, he was a member of high society. Uh, Yerkes was his wife wore couture, they were from Philadelphia society, they belonged to clubs, that kind of thing. So um, Somaripa would have uh, worked for, worked under the general auspices of Leonard Yerkes, and uh, he would have been, for his time in Buffalo, I think he was pretty much a one-man show when he was head of the statistics department. And so he would have known Leonard Yerkes, he would have had interactions with Len Yerkes, but he wasn't part of the top decision makers. Although I think he was quite influential because it was not that Len, Japan Rand Company wasn't like a big bureaucratic place. It was like a small company compared to what DuPont would eventually become. So I think that people were, were inter, interacting with each other on some on some way. They weren't all running around in shorts and stuff, but and saying yo, but they were interacting. Okay, so so he's um so you've got the big guy at the top, Len Yerkes, and you've got a, a, a kind of a coterie of um, uh, smaller managers that are uh, around him. So he has his team of managers, but then you see start to emerge um, scientists that kind of have their teams. A guy named Charch is in charge of uh, the research lab in Buffalo, and Hound Schultz Smith has written about him. He was involved in cellophane, but he was also involved in rayon. And you've got this statistics office that is trying to gather statistics on, well, gee, like we're making rayon and we're selling it to textile mills, but we really don't know where it's going after it we sell it to the textile mills. Let's figure that out. So I'd like to tell you about his first project. Oh, please. His first project was um, a joint project with the um, a competitor <laughs> and uh, an important organization uh, in American retailing. So in, he was hired to actually do a big national survey, statistical survey. You saw how he studied statistics, how he worked with the marketing guru, Copeland. Um, so his job was to do a big national survey of women and women's preferences for certain kinds of fabrics and certain types of clothing, ready-made clothing articles. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is the day when uh, 
fabrics were still the fashion. So you and I go to the store today, you go to J. Crew and you bought that nice white shirt and that nice jacket. And I went to Talbot's and I bought this nice dress. It's all ready to wear. Ready to wear was around in the 1920s and there was a lot of it, but it wasn't as prevalent as it is today. Hmm. Back in the day, most women knew how to sew. They learned to sew from their mothers or grandmothers, or they took classes in high school and they knew how to sew and they had, still had a sewing machine. And uh, so fashion was considered, fabrics were part of fashion. So Soma Ripa's national study for um, DuPont, a competitor and a retailer, focused on what women wanted in fabrics and what they may wanted in what limited ready to wear there was. Hmm. And so who, did, who was this done by? This survey was um, done with conjunction with the Viscose Company. The Viscose Company was the largest manufacturer of Viscose Rayon in the United States. It was a branch of Courtauld, the big British manufa uh, rayon manufacturing company. And they were just down the street from Wilmington. They were in Marcus Hook. You can go today to Marcus Hook and you can go and look at the ruined porn. You can look at the, the remnants of the American viscose plant there. Mm -hmm. They were the largest manufacturer of rayon. And they, uh, and together, the DuPont company, the uh, viscose rayon, and the third organization sponsored this study. The third organization um, is not an organization that we would, it has a mouthful. <laughs> it's a mouthful. It was called the National Retail Dry Goods Association. Now, today, we would not have anything with that big, long name like that. We would have some kind of acronym, but it's a National Retail Dry Goods Association. And what was that? It was the big organization for all of the retailers across the country that sold fabrics and ready-to-wear. Hmm. <coughs> so this was a, a big national study, the first of its kind, first that I've been able to determine of anybody using modern marketing and statistical practices and techniques to go out into the field. He had a team that went out to you know, St. Louis and to Missouri and to Wyoming and to everywhere and look at major stores and small stores and study what they were selling, how they were selling it, what the clerk's response was, what the manager's response was, and what the consumer's response was. Very, very early market research. There, was early, there, were, there were some earlier examples of market research done by Curtis Publishing company before the war and by this time Jane Walter Thompson was doing advertising agency was doing market surveys but this was the first survey that I've ever seen of the fashion business okay so it's really did really neat isn't that cool yeah and um there's um three there's a series of these studies they go on from about 1925 to 1930 he does one and they love it um and the uh, viscose people love it the dry goods people love it Dupont loves it and they say, go do more, and they fund more projects. So he does a series of these studies over five years. And they're published. They're published. It's interesting. They're not kept private. They're actually hmm. published for the benefit of the industry. So it's kind of an interesting moment in the history of the rayon industry where there's this idea that maybe the competitors can collaborate. It's like a Hooverist, like a, almost like a Herbert Hoover kind of vision of um, co collaborative associationism. You know, like maybe we can all we can be competitors, but we can still collaborate. And so um, they ship these, mar these uh, studies were published in the trade journals. They're little booklets that you can get on interlibrary loan. If you dig uh, hard enough, you can find them, little booklets um, on these um, studies. And they're basically full of pre-Excel material. <laughs> so today we use Excel to gather all of our statistics and we make beautiful charts. Well, before Excel, they did all this, they gathered all this stuff by hand added up with the adding machine and made charts by hand. And these booklets have all these pie charts and all these tables saying women, you know, like women want softer fabrics or women don't like rayon stockings because they're too shiny or women want, a, um, want a fabric that no, doesn't make noise when you touch it. I mean, it's full of, it's very, very detailed, and you can see why the managers just kind of, you know, said this is too much for us. But if you're in the market, you need that kind of detail. If you're a, a selling rayon in Columbus, Ohio, you have a dry goods store, that's a fabric store, and you want to stock 
different kinds of fabrics, it might be useful for you to know that women like softer fabrics rather than harsher fabrics. So they don't want cloth that's loud or they don't want stockings that are shiny. This is the kind of stuff that he's finding out. And he does three, he does about a dozen series of these. And uh, they're, uh, they're, they're too detailed for me, but uh, so what does DuPont do with these? Mm -hmm. So DuPont so actually uses his information as he's gathering information already in 1926 when he first comes on board. He's starting to just gather the preliminary information and he, it's fed into the rayon plant at Buffalo. And the scientists in the rayon plant, people like Charch and his assistants and uh, engineers start to adjust DuPont rayon so that it's not so shiny, and so that the filaments are not so shiny, that the filaments are create yarn that's softer. And so this enables DuPont to break into the underwear trade, okay? And so rayon initially goes into ladies' underwear. All those sweet little nothings that uh, women used to wear underneath their flapper dresses were all made from rayon. And originally they were made for silk, but then that by the 20s, that late 20s, they're all made from rayon. And this allows DuPont to get into that market quite a bit. And so, uh, it also allows uh, DuPont to uh, understand that rayon's too shiny. Hmm. So, so rayon was invented as a silk substitute, and silk has a certain amount of sheen to it, it's a certain amount of luster. But rayon has almost too, mu too much luster. And they discover through this market research that women don't like really, really shiny stockings, hmm. that they want stockings that, have, that look more like silk, that have some shininess, but not a lot. So they figure out, well, we got to figure out how to make rayon less shiny. It's not so, something Soma Ripa does, because he's not a scientist. But the scientists up in Buffalo take his information, and they start to figure out, well, how can we make rayon filament less shiny? Well, can we add this to it? Can we add that to it? Can we squeeze it out differently? Blah, 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 blah. And that's what they do. And they come up with different types of yarns that they can then market as being low, lust, low luster or they uh, uh, ultra soft and so on and so forth. So that's mm. what he contributes in, in the very, very early days of rayon. So it's like, it's what's, there is ready to wear and ready to wear is uh, sewn up in places like New York and Philadelphia, uh, Boston. And that's like dresses like I'm wearing that are made from woven cloth, okay? But there's also knitwear. So that's like our, what our underwear like we're wearing, that's knitted, okay? Mm. And so this early rayon mostly goes into knitwear. So Maripa's next step, which starts in 1930, takes it into the ready-to-wear territory. Does he apply the same statistical techniques to that um, new challenge? No. So what he does is he's based in Buffalo and then eventually moves to New York. And so um, he does not apply the statistical analysis. He takes more of a, a humanistic approach, which mm -hmm. I'd like to talk about. Well, please and do. More, yeah, so let me, but let me tell you something really important story that I, I'm going to tell in the book. And so he's in Buffalo in the first part of his career, and he's working in some back office probably in Buffalo, right? In some, you know, glass office with, you know, wooden panels. And you know how they were in the 1920s. Little's name is probably on the door, maybe. <laughs> and he's up there with his, his adding machine. And eventually, DuPont, um, Rayon Company, Leonard Yerkes says, well, if we're really going to get anywhere in this Rayon business, we got to have our headquarters for the DuPont Rayon Company. has got to be in New York. So he lobbies the DuPont managers, the top dogs, the executive committee at the DuPont Company. And he says, we're going to move to New York. And they have this debate about whether they're going to move to New York. It's 1928. And uh, he says, basically, the future of fashion York says, the future of fashion is in New York City, and we have to be there. This fabulous quote from, from the DuPont archives, where he, this letter where he says this to his boss, Lamont DuPont. And uh, they go back and forth, and eventually the DuPonts say, okay, fine, you can move to New York. And so here's the great part of the story. So they move to New York. Now, when people write about New York, they kind of like, it's almost like it's a black box. I was reading uh, Anna Winter's uh, biography the other day. It's a new biography of a famous Vogue editor. It's written by a journalist. And she talks about New York like it's a black box. Anna worked at this magazine, and then she worked at that magazine, and she worked at this place and that place. You never know where the magazines are located, where the buildings are. 
You never know where she actually went shopping to buy her haute couture. It's like a black box. Mm -hmm. And the same goes when people talk about New York as a garment center. They say, oh, 7th Avenue was important and that garments were made there, first on the Lower East Side and then on 7th Avenue. And then they leave it, okay? But it turns out <laughs> that this entire area where the Empire State Building eventually goes at 5th Avenue and 34th Street is the heart of the textile district. And it's there serving the new 7th Avenue garment district. And DuPont in 1928 moves its uh, corporate offices into 2 Park Avenue, which is a brand new skyscraper designed by um, famous modernist architect uh, Khan and colorized by Leon Victor Solon, one of the people I've studied in, my, in the color revolution. <laughs> They moved into this fabulous Art Deco skyscraper at 2 Park Avenue. It's called the, the center of the garment district. That's how it's marketed. And they're in this building right there on 2 Park Avenue. Uh, Empire State's not up yet. They're in this building right there. And so what's next door? So across the street or down the block or around the corner are all the silk warehouses, the silk showrooms. And they're still there. The buildings are still there. New York has done this fabulous job preserving a lot of the Art Deco wonders for being Art Deco. Mm -hmm. But what, what the architectural historians don't really talk about is that they were textiles. They were for selling textiles. I'm like so excited. And so um, the Cheney Brothers Silk Manufacturing Company, for example, had mm -hmm. a fabulous Art Deco showroom at the corner of um, Park Avenue and 34th Street, just around the corner or up the street or something from 2 Park Avenue. And it was a fat Art Deco marvel that was written up in all the architectural magazines, but it sold silk textiles. So 2 Park Avenue is a textile building, and that's where DuPont sets up its headquarters. And so Maripa, in 1928, moves to Buffalo, moves from Buffalo to New York, and he's doing the statistics. He's doing the statistics. He's in that building. And so what he does is he's, he's interested in style. And DuPont is early on in the, once it's in New York, they are in the middle of the textile district. They start to say, well, we got to we'll take advantage of the fact that we're here. We moved here so we could be at the place where it was all happening. We could mm -hmm. be amidst all the textile showrooms. And they start to uh, do this unique thing. They introduce this thing called the Fabric Development Service. Okay. What is the Fabric Development Service? And, and it, so Maripa, even though he's doing his statistics, is credited with the idea for the Fabric Development Service. So you can see DuPont Rayon Company is still fairly small, and they're all interacting at this point in time. And so there's like fluidity. And so what is the Fabric Development Service? Okay, so let's think about it. If you're DuPont and you're a chemical company and you've got this plant in Buffalo and you want to break into the textile and fashion business big time, well, like, how are you going to convince a New England textile mill, like Pacific Mills, to use rayon? Why would the Pacific Mills, one of the largest textile mills in America, like, use this new fiber? Mm -hmm. Like, why? So you've got to, if you're Viscos, the Viscos company in Marcus Hook, if you're uh, DuPont, you've got to get some kind of mechanism in place to, con to interface with those textile mills not just saying, oh, here's our like fiber, here's our, some filaments. Will you buy our filaments? You've got to say, this is what our filaments will do. Okay. Mm. And so they develop essentially a design service operating on a two park avenue. And the first thing wow. that they talk about, and it's hard, this is really hard to get information on it. I'm, I'm working on it for earlier chapter is that they uh, target the interior design field. Because it's also like there's showrooms for silk mills, but it's also interior design everywhere in New York. And it's like the interior design center. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the automobile manufacturers have their showrooms there. People don't know it, but the first floor of the Chrysler building was like auto showrooms. Uh. <laughs> it was like all the cars, <laughs> or all Chrysler cars were all, the, all in the auto showroom on the first floor. And so um, the, all the, so they would have had New York office of designers designing like parts of the cars, not not all of it, but you know the interiors. And so um, as they start to target, as they as they come up with this idea for the fabric development service, they start to say, well, let's try this out with interior design. 
And so they network with the interior design community in New York. And they, what they do is that they uh, weave up sample fabrics and they say, uh, here's a sample of what we wove, here's a swatch, okay? And uh, look at what rayon can do. Look at the cute textures you can get and the interesting uh, uh, treatments you can get and the good colors you can get with our dyes. Why don't you try this in your new Oldsmobile? Or why don't you try this in your new installation at the such and such a skyscraper building? And that's what they do. And that's how mm -hmm. they start to do fabric development. So they're essentially a design service. And so it's Somaripa's idea. So because he, remember, he had that textile, hands-on textile training at the Lowell Textile Industry Institute where he studied weaving. So he knew, so designing textiles is not a matter. People sometimes misunderstand what designing textiles is. It's, I read a book called Fashionability, which was on um, a British tweed mill called Abraham Moon and Sons, and they're still in operation today. And uh, I never really thought about what textile design involved, but before I wrote this book, and it's very highly mathematical. It's not simply a matter of creating a sketch on paper that looks like this. You actually have to lay out the, um, on, on uh, chart paper, you have to lay out the weavings, you have to understand how the looms work. So uh, it's a highly technical and mathematical um, process. And it not only involves textile design, not only involves making like little striped patterns like this, um, it involves creating, let me see if I can find an example. I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't get my show and tell ready. Um, it involves like creating fabrics that themselves have textures. Okay, so I'm looking at your, your uh, jacket there and it's blue and it has like texture, it has some kind of texture to it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It has like a tweed or something. So somebody designed that, okay? So if you look at this, this, this dress has got the pattern on it, but the cloth itself also has texture yeah. that's printed on. And so what you've got to, so what they start to do is that the DuPont Fabric Development Service is they start to design these fabrics. They not only say, oh, here's a cute print that you can print up with our, on our rayon, but here's what the fabric, and look at how well it drapes. Look at how soft it is. Look at the cute uh, effects that you can get in for your upholstery for your uh, interior installation if you mm. use rayon as opposed to wool and you won't get eaten up by moss like it will get eaten up by moss if you use wool, so on and so forth. And so that's what they do out of Two Park Avenue. Now in 1930, they move to 1931, the Empire State Building uh, is opened. It's funded by the DuPont uh, interests, broadly defined. I think you had a recent podcast on this topic mm -hmm. and uh, DuPont moves to the Empire State Building. So we have another chapter in the life of Soma Ripa after that. Well, what comes next? Um, does the uh, fabric design service move into the Empire State Building as well? Yes, so um, the, uh, at, at, by 1930 or so, um, Soma Ripa is no longer doing the statistics. He's kind of wrapped up that project. He's generated, he's, demonstrated, he's shown his medal He's proved his, that he's a worthy, <laughs> he's done all these statistical studies and the Buffalo plant is using his information to um, improve the fibers. And um, the uh, DuPont company in sales office in New York is saying, well, yeah, he's got good ideas, okay? So he uh, is a young man with good ideas. And so they put him in charge of the fabric development service starting in 1930. Now, unfortunately, there's very little evidence of his early work at the Fabric Development Service. The surviving reports, uh, as you know, no archive is complete, and the reports don't really uh, pick up until uh, 1935. I knew that they existed. They existed before that, but there just aren't any. And so he had a staff moving to the Empire State Building. And the Empire State Building, you know, in 1931 was a, somewhat of a dinosaur. They couldn't get anybody to rent it, but DuPont was there. And that doesn't mean that all around the Empire State Building, there were all these, still all these fabric showrooms, okay? And they were still down 34th Street. There. Why, so why is the Empire State Building important? Why is the location important? I don't know that I haven't seen any evidence from the books I've read about it or the documents I've studied that anyone was thinking textile industry. <laughs> but it ends up being really important for the textile industry and for DuPont because of its location in the heart of the textile district. Hmm. Okay? 
So the Waldorf Astoria Old Hotel had been there in the heart of the textile district. But so let's talk a little bit more about this textile district because it's so important. And uh, so you've got the fabric showrooms for Cheney Brothers and Sidney Blumenthal and all the high-end silk manufacturers, which end up buying a lot of rayon. And you, down the street, down 34th Street, and if you walk from Empire State Building just down to Macy's, what do you get to? You get to Herald Square, you've got Macy's. You've got Macy's as the major mass market store in uh, New York. And all around Macy's at Herald Square, there are other stores which are now gone. You walk a few blocks further, you hit 7th Avenue, which uh, from maybe 22nd Street up to 42nd Street is all garment manufacturing, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you go the other direction, you look north, what do you see north? You see B. Altman and the beginning of the elite Fifth Avenue shopping district. To the south on Fifth Avenue are the carpet showrooms, carpet showrooms, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. This is why mm -hmm. I get so irritated when I read these books that say Anna Wintar, you know, or whoever worked at such and such a magazine. Well, like, where was that magazine located? You know, it turns out Condé Nast is like right here in the middle of all this, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, the space is really important. So mm -hmm. the space is important for Salma Ripa. It's important for DuPont because DuPont in New York is right in the middle of the textile garment fashion retailing center. So part of Somaripa's job, and once he's in charge of the fabric development service, a salesman managed it in its early days, an experienced salesman. And then once Somaripa was done with his quantitative studies, it, put him, it seems that they put him in charge. So what does he do? He gathers a staff. And the staff is basically guys who know sales, and it's all men, it's mostly men. Men who know sales, and uh, but he also brings on board people who know fabric design, to have fabric designers. They have uh, uh, just specialists in retail. They have specialists in garment manufacturing working for him. And mm -hmm. I have the names of these people and I can trace them a little bit, but I can only do so much with the book. I mean, I could write a whole book about just this, this one guy. And um, so uh, he sets up a team in the Empire State Building and they do a number of things. One is they do, they, they don't do quantitative studies, but they're right there in the heart of it all, in the thick of it all, in the New York Textile District, the 7th Avenue and Macy's and 5th Avenue, just at their feet. So they go shopping. <laughs> they literally spend a lot of time in the field. And I think that this is actually what happens in the textile and garment district and retailing fields at this time. This is how you gather information. You go and you look. Mm -hmm. In the color revolution, I wrote about a woman named Margaret Hayden Rourke, who was also in this textile district. At the time, I didn't realize how significant it was. But she's also, her offices, the color association, are located in this area. And she's out on the streets. She's out walking around, looking at people. She's in B. Altman's. She's in Lord & Taylor. She's in Bergdorf. She's in Macy's. She's in Gimbel's. And she's looking at people as they shop. And she's looking at the merchandise. That's what the fabric development people do. But they also create these idea fabrics. That's their, they, by this, eventually they became known as idea fabrics. So they're, they, they, they're in the center of where it's happening. They're interfacing with the retailers. They're going to the showrooms of the textile industry. They're chatting up the people in, the, in Pacific Mills and um, uh, all these other textile mills. And then they create, they come up with this idea, let's create idea, these idea fabrics. So they start to do that informally in the Two Park Avenue, but then they really have a program of idea fabrics. So in the reports that ex exist, you can see swatches of the idea fabrics. Oh, and wow. so they, um, so they, they create, <clears throat> it's all very, very technical and very esoteric for us. It's like a lot of detail that it's that detail orientation that one of the managers threw up his hands with, you know, with Samarika, this is too much detail. But that detail is needed if you're in the textile industry and you're trying to sell these goods. So what happens in the 1930s is mm -hmm. as follows in the rayon industry. In 1929, um, 
the average American woman, now I know we're not supposed to say that these days, we're supposed to look be more diverse and all that and say there's no such thing, but the average American woman in 1930, whether she was Polish American or Italian American or African American, wanted to have a silk dress. She wanted to have a silk dress that she could wear to church on Sunday or to go shopping because people got dressed up to go shopping in little white gloves and little hats and uh, uh, little shoes and heels and they looked nice. They went shopping in their nice late, nice dress or they went to church or they went to a wedding. They needed a, a silk dress and that's mm -hmm. made from woven fabric. The silk is imported from Japan. It's uh, the silk mills in New England and New Jersey in New York make the silk fabric and then the Seventh Avenue garment people sew it up or women buy the fabric and they sew up their own dress. That's in 1929, okay? They want a silk dress. Mm -hmm. By 1939, they want a rayon dress. Is that right? <laughs> okay. Because it's it, it so what happens over the course of the 1930s is the market is transformed. Mm -hmm. And Somaripa plays a big part in that. Somaripa and his team and uh, at DuPont and the other rayon makers play a big part in that. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that rayon over the course of the 1930s, because of the interventions, of people like Somaripa, who's gathering information as he's working and sending it up to Buffalo and sending it to Waynesboro, and they're improving the fibers. His interventions with fabric development and, and the lowering price of rayon, together, the aesthetics and the price during the Depression period allow Rayon to make great inroads in the dress market. Mm. You have to show and tell. Let me get a show and tell. Sure. I just happened to be looking, I just happened to be looking at these uh, items yesterday. So here we go. So here is 1939. These are the types of fashions that we're talking about. 1939, mm. ready to uh -huh. wear. So National was a company based in the 7th Avenue Garment District. Okay, so these dresses would have been made out of either silk or rayon at this point in time. Okay, mm -hmm. now let me go slightly later because uh, we go to, hmm, well, maybe I could do it with this, 1939. Okay, so again, 1939, this dress was probably made out of rayon. Okay, so this is a um, Chicago company. So this would have been, they were ready to wear factories in Chicago as well. So this uh, cloth would have been made in New England, New Jersey, could have been made in Ohio, but most of the textile mills were in the North or in the South. And then this rayon fabric would have been um, you know, made with any kind of uh, rayon, could have been Viscose, could have been DuPont, could have been any number of companies. If it's sewn into this fabric and then the ready to wear factories in Chicago or even New York or probably Chicago made this up into a rayon dress. Um, here we go. This is great. Oh, wow. These are rayon, 1939. What are they made out of? Made out of rayon. Wow. Okay. And it says um, uh, roughly $2 uh, yeah. as the price point for yeah. these so they're, dresses. They're very competitive prices. These would be, I haven't done an analysis. I probably should do an analysis for the book. I haven't done that yet, but they're very competitive prices. This is bad. the total mass market. So I, my career has been, um, notable for the fact that I work on the mass market. I don't work on haute couture. I don't work on uh, Spode China. I worked on Homer Lachlan China. I didn't work on cut glass. I worked on press glass. So here I am continuing mm -hmm. that tradition. The mass, here's what's happened to the mass market. So we're not oh. talking about something that Anna Wintour would have even looked at if she had been alive <laughs> at this point in time. Okay? Mm -hmm. But these are all rounds. So if you look at the, it says here, uh, I like this one, the slimming, figure slimming, that's a good one, uh, but they're all uh, Canton crepe, a cellulose acetate rayon Canton crepe, okay? Wow. So that's Soma Ripa's uh, work, okay? Mm. So what they do is that they, uh, they're in the market, they create idea fabrics, and this is something I just learned the other day, they create idea fabrics, and they go to the textile mill and they show them these swatch books. They create the swatches, and they, they have uh, little swatches, swatch books that they make. I, none of them have survived, but I'm sure they're common, swatch books are commonplace in the textile trade. They're basically fold-out books and the swatches are pasted in, pasted in. And then, or they would go with the little uh, samples of the fabric, and they would say, look, here's some new rayon 
uh, weaves that we've created, they're woven. Here's some rayon weaves we've, our team at DuPont has designed. If you buy our rayon, you can take these designs and you can use them in your mill. Mm. Okay? So DuPont is designing the fabrics. Okay? So, I mean, it's just this fabulous story of this hidden history of how the fashion system works. It's not the genius designer, some genius designer in Paris saying, oh, well, you know, we've got to have this, that, and the other thing. It's these foot soldiers that are making the fashion system work. Speaking of Paris, however, Samaripa, who is just um, Mr. Elegant European, goes to Europe on three major trips. One is 28, 35, and 37. These reports from 1935 and 1937 survive. And so um, he's famously remembered for his early trip trip in 1928. It's said that he first thing he did was to sail across the Atlantic and come back with uh, trunks of samples. So mm -hmm. he would go to the silk mills <laughs> And he would go to the mills, and some of them were using rayon quite early on, but mostly it would be silk. And he would bring back silk samples and say, well, how can we you know, like, copy this European silk, these fabulous designs in rayon, and, for the, and adapt it for the American market? And so what he does is in 1938, he goes, 37, sorry, 35 and 37, he goes to Europe. His trip reports survive, and you can see what he's doing in Europe. He's going, he's shopping. He's going around from mill to mill talking with the designers, talking with the managers. He's going from shop to shop, buying samples. Um, he's, uh, doing, he's on a reconnaissance mission for six to eight weeks in Europe uh, in the 1930s, twice. And you can, he goes to Paris, and he goes and he hooks up with a uh, Lyon uh, silk manufacturer named uh, Colcombe. They're quite known to be innovative and use, uh, be interested in using new materials. Now, of course, the stereotype today is, oh, no, the haute couturiers, they never would have used synthetic fibers. Somebody actually said that <laughs> once. And, of course, that's not true because they were interested in the new materials, <laughs> the new exciting materials that could give them novel effects. So Colcombe Bay worked with designers like Scaparelli and uh, designed unique fabrics for her. And... Um, uh, uh, so Maripa went to uh, Paris and he visited the showroom and he met with Scaparelli and he uh, talked to her about DuPont materials. And we don't know if she ended up using DuPont designs, but she was known for being quite innovative in her uh -huh. approach to fabrics. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to dig more into that uh, for the book, but it, suffice to say that he met, we know he, he met with Scaparelli. And DuPont was in the fashion business. Pont was in the fashion business. Yeah. Oh, that is yep. just fascinating. Yeah. And Reggie, thank you for sharing that story with me. Okay, great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And for the audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts, more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, join us online. You can visit hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. Don't be a stranger. <laughs>